We use cover crops to help us to cover a couple different ways. It's really applying a couple of the soil health principles. Keep a living root in the ground, introduce diversity, keep the soil covered. And of course, we like to graze all winter and that helps a bunch. Those roots have hit that and just gone sideways. And that means when water soaks down and hits that, it goes sideways as well. It doesn't go in. We planted this cover crop into, a, it, was a, it was a mess. There's still a long way to go to make this better. That looks almost impermeable. The way we fix that is with roots. Our regenerative journey started with seven research ranches, a total of 14,000 acres. Located across southern Oklahoma, each ranch property is unique in topography, use, and history. We want to take you along on our journey, showing you the challenges, the lessons we've learned, and the victories along the way to regenerating the ranch. Planting cover crops has been a vital part of the forage management on our noble ranches. Can you find a sun hemp root ball? We'll dig a sun hemp root ball up. In my mind, we've been planting cover crops in the cool season on Bermuda grass for decades. We just didn't call it that. It's not been anything new to overseed something like cereal rye into Bermuda grass during the winter and we've called it overseeding. It's been a monoculture, cool season grass in a monoculture, warm season grass. We're getting more scientific with it, more complex mixes, more diversity, more intentional, and for more reasons, rather than just to have additional forage to graze. Now it's for the forage, it's for the soil, it's for the health of the livestock, it's for the profit. So energy cycle, water cycle, nutrient cycle, these cover crops are are mining up nutrients, and then those nutrients will be left on the surface. This sorghum might be pulling nutrients up from six feet deep, and now those nutrients are at the surface when this plant decays at the surface and, and can help feed the, the future crop, grazing crop, forage crop, cover crop. A year ago, we'd planted this to soybeans and then just a wheat crop in the fall. So we went from monoculture beans to monoculture wheat, and then this last summer is whenever we planted this multi-species cover crop in here. In this field, like many fields, as people are transitioning, uh, may have been the first time there's been livestock on this in decades. And we see that a lot as, as folks are going from maybe a hay meadow that's just been hay forever. Now we're reintroducing livestock and that's Another one of the soil health principles is properly integrate livestock. And so a lot of folks are at the early stages of that right now. There's still a long way to go to make this better. That looks almost impermeable. Those roots have hit that and just gone sideways. And that means when water soaks down and hits that, it goes sideways as well. It doesn't go in. The way we fix that is with roots, with a diversity of roots with an abundance of roots to feed the biology. It does have just a little bit of an aroma. Yeah, it does. A little bit of a soil smell. And, and I would expect a year ago, if we were in this same field one year ago, this would have just smelled like dirt, just like dust on your windowsill, I, I would expect. After coming from a hard drought spell, we are trusting we will see some rain this fall. We are planning out our fall planning for cool season cover crops. So this fall, we've adapted our plan. We really need to have forage for the cows to graze. We had 60 days of no significant rain during our growing season. So right now we're really focusing on growing what we feel pretty confident we can grow, getting it up, being able to graze it and put it back down. We needed a cool season mix in here so we have something to put in front of animals so we have that animal impact. There can be a lot of reasons for whatever mix a person chooses and I'm always going to refer back to the ecosystem processes and diversity and maximizing the nutrient cycle and water cycle and energy cycle but also the, the soil health principles of integrate plant diversity and armor the soil 
but price absolutely and availability. The dependable ones are the small grains, vetch, peas, clover, chicory, plantain. Those are all winter hardy, winter, winter tolerant. It's interesting, I believe the cover crop mix that was planted in this field and the cover crop mix planted in probably all of the fields this summer were the same, Yes. at least on this farm. Yes. And in each field we see a little bit different expression of what did the best. That's one thing I like about a mix. If, if I had planted all sun hemp in this field, I might not have much of a crop. And if I had planted all pearl millet in the other field, I might not have much of a crop. But with that mix, it, it can adapt. Because we never know what Mother Nature is going to throw at us one year to the next. So we're, we're no-till drilling this and, and we're planting green, our cover crop or summer cover or forage or whatever you want to call it at this point. It's still green and growing. If we were to terminate this some way with chemical or wait until frost, we could potentially have two weeks that there's nothing growing here. And so that biology is going to be on a Jenny Craig diet during that time. This way, that biology that's in the soil is, is always being fed by the root exudates from growing plants. Ideally, the holy grail might be if our cover crop seed was allowed to mature and we made enough seed that, that we had so much that even with what dies during the winter, comes up in the fall and dies, or what doesn't survive the winter, that it would reseed itself and then volunteer, come back on their own next year and have a cover crop that we didn't even have to plant. That would be, that'd be great. Think of the cost savings that would be. Typically, we utilize a no-till drill to plant our cover crops. We are testing something a little bit different that we have found a little success with on a couple of our pastures. This morning, we're here at the Red River. We're here in pasture 33 and 34. The cows are about two days away from this pasture. We're going to move them in here. And so we're going to go ahead and just spread the seed and get it on the ground, and then we'll, we'll run them through here. And it'll probably be in between 30 to 50,000 pounds of stock density. Nothing real big, but uh, try to trample it in and see if we can make it work this year like we did last year. Traditionally, we usually plant these cover crops, cool season cover crops, with a no-till drill. Basically what a no-till drill does, it'll cut a small furrow, drop the seed in the soil, maybe one inches deep or so. Then it'll come back with a press wheel, press it down, and then it'll come back with a cover wheel and cover it up. Here what we're doing with this spreader, we're just basically doing the same thing except for we're gonna do it with the cows. We're gonna spread it out, bring the cows in here at some decent stock density, let them tromp it down and hopefully get seed to soil contact and hopefully get a rain on it, get it up. There's some areas here that are really, really rough that if we can make this work like we want to, that it would be a whole lot better than trying to pull a drill across it. There's areas down here in these pecan orchards that it would be a whole lot easier just to broadcast it and use the cows to plant it than it would be to try to have to run a drill under the trees and all that. Plus, you know, some people don't have a no-till drill. A no-till drill is expensive. A person could go down to his co-op and rent a spreader and, 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 and do this on his own. He could even do it with his pickup, you know, so pick up the cows. So that, that's, that's one big advantage I see of it. And on the theme of trying new things. We were looking for other alternatives to help us grow more forage instead of relying on chemical fertilizer. And that's when we came across this pelleted, composted chicken litter. It was supposed to be more biologically available. It's gonna be easier for us to handle and spread. It doesn't smell like just straight chicken litter. And it's supposed to stay in the soil and keep giving you benefits for several years. So we've pulled the trigger and we're gonna try some of that this year in some test areas and I have really high hopes for it. I mean, I'd like to put it in lots of places. If it works good, it just kind of jump starts our biology. Here we are this morning, Red River. Got the uh, first load of poultry litter in yesterday. Don't have a whole lot of experience with it. We've used lots of synthetic fertilizers through the years on this ranch. 
This year we're gonna try to use some chicken litter and just play with it and see how it turns out. It's kind of like a time release, so you'll get part of the good out of it this fall and part of the good out of it this spring and then maybe even some more good out of it next fall. It's not just a one time and you're done thing. I'm gonna put down about a thousand pounds to the acre on a, about 60 acres over here. Hopefully it'll kick off some of the biology in the soil and, and, and get some things working and, and see how we get along. I think the poultry litter is probably gonna do a whole lot better things for the soil than, than the synthetic fertilizers do. It can help us start some biology and, and then we can come back and keep it going with our grazing. The pelleted composted chicken litter that we're buying is more expensive than conventional fertilizer, but we're also hoping to get several years of use out of one application. So if we spread the cost over several years, it ends up being cheaper than applying chemical fertilizer every year. Everybody that we've talked to swears by it and swears the biology is, is worth the price. This past year, we've really struggled with our cover crops, even from the winter of 2021. We just had a really dry winter. And then the spring was more of the same. We planted, had a little bit emerge, and we never got the rain to get them to grow. So they've been sitting out there for two and a half months. And now that we finally got some rain, we're starting to see some of our warm season cover crops starting to grow up and be grazable now that we're ready to start planting our cool season cover crops. If we don't get a good stand of this fall cover crop, it would set us back. and We might have to sell some bread cows, but I don't think we're relying on it as heavily as we would have if we hadn't made our pre-plans our pre -plans for the drought. But things have really turned around in the last 45 days with the rain that we've had. And if the, the cover crops were a great success, we'd be able to keep a lot more more bred animals around, maybe buy, buy some undervalued animals and begin to stock the ranch back up. Because from an average standpoint, I think we're still understocked. This has just been a bad year for grass. So if everything goes back, hopefully we can build back up and be ready for higher prices the next year.